Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. Um, I would like to thank the Rachel Carson Center for this opportunity to speak about my research and for the wonderful experience in general of being a Landhouse Fellow this fall. I would also like to specifically thank everyone at the center who helped organize, promote, and set up today's event, and I look forward to the questions and discussions that will follow. My presentation will consist of an overview of the major themes that make up the argument of my dissertation, which is more specifically titled Aloha Aina as Medium, Land, Art, and Sovereignty in Post-Statehood Hawaii. While I'll primarily be focusing on Hawaii today, this material is only one strain of my current research program, re-examining the American land art movement of the 1960s and 1970s within the context of US settler colonialism and imperialism analyzing visual culture concurrently produced alongside resistance to military occupation, social movements for agrarian reform, and anti-colonial national liberation struggles. In addition to briefly dis discussing land art and explaining what it actually is in the middle of my talk, I'll end with a gesture toward the other aspects of my research that make up my book project in progress, which is presently titled Land Art Liberation. Given the likelihood that everyone here has differing levels of knowledge about Hawaii, I want to begin with an extended analysis of a work that simultaneously functions as an introductory history lesson to Hawaii, and which is likewise helpful for situating the other projects I'll soon detail. Entering the 2017 Honolulu Biennial, visitors were immediately greeted by what appeared to be an innocently idyllic, if not kitschy, landscape depiction of Hawaii, one that might, at first glance, conform to a dominant representation of the islands we have come to expect. Hanging on the wall directly opposite the venue's entrance doors was Kanaka Maoli or Native Hawaiian artist Drew Kahuaina Broderick's Billboard One, The Sovereignty of the Land is Perpetuated in Righteousness. The work featured a large vinyl banner spotlighting two palm trees sitting gracefully on a rocky cliffside before an airy sunset sky complemented by a neon sign attached in the upper left corner reading vacancy and accompanied by a lit palm tree of its own. Although seemingly mimicking a generic promotion for tourism, Broderick's billboard was in fact derived from zooming in on the background of British artist George Carter's 1783 painting, Death of Captain Cook, a one-to-one -one replica of which was installed to the right of its vinyl appropriation. Broderick had removed the entire Oceanside battle scene depicting the murder of Cook by Native Hawaiians in Carter's painting, deciding instead to only transpose the backdrop of peacefully perched palms to the billboard. In doing so, he suggests that one can simply crop out the unsavory aspects of history and people's resistance to such events to match their preconceived fantasies of Hawaii, leaving their worldview blissfully unchallenged. Combining the selective cropping of an 18th century history painting, the work's blown up size, and his electrical addition, Broderick directly linked Hawaii's contemporary tourist image to a longer, less romanticized account of the islands. Excuse me. One that is inseparable from centuries of foreign aggression originating with Cook's so-called discovery of Hawaii in 1778 and continuing through the present. To better understand the motivations of Broderick and the other artists I will be discussing, it is helpful to quickly provide some complex historical context. In 1893, a group of white settler businessmen acting in the imperial interests of the US and backed by its military forces overthrew the Hawaiian kingdom in a bourgeois revolution, setting up a coup government and declaring the Republic of Hawaii a year later. Thanks to sustained efforts by Kanaka Maoli in the form of the Kue petitions, attempts to officially annex the islands to the US actually ultimately failed. However, an internal joint resolution was passed in the US Congress in 1898, effectively annexing the islands despite there being no legal treaty of annexation. In 1959, a statehood vote open to all current residents was held with no option for independence, as should have been required following the United Nations 1946 listing of Hawaii as a non-self-governing territory. 
Today, settler colonial domination derived from these histories is maintained by the US's ongoing military occupation, the nefarious nature of which is intentionally downplayed or outright obscured by Hawaii's global tourist image. Broderick's work plays with language in multiple ways to allude to the entirety of this timeline, most evidently through the concept of vacancy referenced in the neon signage. While vacancy refers to the idea of vacant lands, the settler colonial necessity to vacate peoples from their lands, and the availability of hotel rooms, Broderick also productively weaponizes it through a desire to make vacant Hawaii's current occupiers, that being the US military. The killing of Cook was, in effect, the first land struggle in Hawaii against colonization. And as we will see, such anti-colonial land struggles are not merely a relic of history, but are very much still ongoing. Indeed, the parenthetical portion of the work's title stages a wholly incompatible dichotomy between Hawaiian conceptions of sovereignty and contemporary US statehood. The sovereignty of the land is perpetuated in righteousness is the English translation of a phrase famously proclaimed by Kamehameha III in 1843 upon the restoration of sovereignty to the Hawaiian kingdom following a brief occupation of the islands led by a rogue British naval officer. Adopted as the state motto upon Hawaii's wholesale inclusion into the US in 1959, the phrase is now held partially captive by its current governmental overseers, subjective subjected to authoritative misuse despite its otherwise revolutionary claim that the land retains inherent sovereignty. By combining this phrase in the work's title with the vacancy sign, Broderick offers us a landscape in which the righteousness and sovereignty of the land can eventually be fully restored through the vacancy of colonial forces. The complexity of Broderick's work relies on his engagement with land as something that is equally a political and cultural entity in Hawaii. Billboard One, Billboard One delineates between a Western conception of land as residing in physical matter and, territor and territorial property, as opposed to Kanaka Maoli, onto the onto epistemological aspects of Aina as cosmological relative and abundant life source. While aina in Olelo Hawaii or the Hawaiian language most directly translates to land, it also means that which feeds. Imbued within an understanding of aina, therefore, is an environmental ethics of ancestral knowledge in a kuleana or responsibility of collective care to sustain current generations without sacrificing future ones. As prominent Hawaiian sovereignty proponent and scholar Haunani K. Trask has stated, quote, the people cannot exist without the land and the land cannot exist without the people, end quote. Such a relational understanding is incompatible with the interests of US imperialism, which, dem which demands control of and access to land as an extractable resource, a weapon of dispossession, and a launching pad for further domination. Demilitarization activist and scholar Kyle Kajihiro highlights these incommensurable differences as follows, quote, Land is a central and continuing source of conflict between the military and Kanaka Maoli. The militarization of land has resulted in the alienation of Kanaka Maoli from their ancestral lands, the loss of subsistence and cultural resources, and the contamination of the air, land, and water with toxic waste, unexploded ordnance, and radiation. At its root, the conflict between Kanaka Maoli and the military over land involves a fundamental clash between the Kanaka Maoli relationship to a living Aina and the Euro-American concept of land as flat and lifeless real estate, end quote. Broderick's billboard is a fitting introduction for the remaining work I will cover today, for it neatly encapsulates how contemporary artists in Hawaii have positioned their work alongside and in conversation with the post-statehood resurgence of the modern Hawaiian sovereignty movement. The work of these artists functions as a staunch critique of colonization and a celebration of anti-colonial resistance, in which liberatory relations to Aina are brought into contestation with the existing material, material conditions of land in Hawaii. In the words of the anti-colonial revolutionary figure, Amilcar Cabral, it is crucial to retur return to the source of the contemporary str struggle for sovereignty and the art and visual culture that arose in tandem. 
In her influential 1987 essay, the aforementioned Trask traces the birth of the modern Hawaiian sovereignty movement to organized resistance against new development in Kalama Valley on the island of Oahu from 1970 to 1971, where community-based assertions for the preservation of agricultural land against resort and subdivision use aimed to stop the evictions of local farmers. During the struggle, the grassroots activist coalition Kokua Hawaii, or Help Hawaii, formulated their six-point people's land program, including the call to save our farmlands to grow food, stop the developers who want to pour concrete over everything, and get back our land from the few big landholders that have almost all of it, among others. The Kalama Valley conflict began only 11 years after Hawaii's statehood and was prompted in part by what this newfound status meant for federal and commercial spending in the islands. As ethnic studies scholar Daviana Pomakai McGregor explains, quote, statehood decisively incorporated Hawaii within the US political system, assuring a stability that bolstered confidence in the economy and made it attractive to US investors, end quote. This very incorporation, however, soon became the driving impetus of resistance. McGregor continues, quote, unexpectedly by the 1970s, rather than fully integrating Hawaii's people into American lifeways, statehood had laid the foundation for a Kanaka O'ivi or Native Hawaiian cultural renaissance and a revival of our historic sovereignty movement, end quote. Kalama Valley also propelled the American-born Ed Grevy into becoming the de facto photographer of the Hawaiian sovereignty movement and related land struggles in the following decades, as he would document countless protests and solidarity events for anti-bombing campaigns, anti-eviction marches, and other various political activities. In this famous image of the Kalama Valley occupation, Grevy's photo shows Kalani Ohelo, a revolutionary Hawaiian nationalist, Ohello stands with his fist raised before a building marked for destruction, upon which a hastily made banner reads, Yankee go home, a phrase that had reemerged in popularity at the time due to fermenting opposition against US involvement in Vietnam, attempting to stop the Marxist-Leninist revolution led by Ho Chi Minh. That such a phrase would also be utilized in Hawaii should come as little surprise. In addition to general anti-American sentiment, Kokua Hawaii's political ideology was driven by Maoism and third world national liberation struggles, with members of the group having participated in the third world liberation front in the San Francisco Bay Area, and also taking inspiration from the American Indian movement, the Black Panthers, and the Young Lords. One Kakua Hawaii member even had a relative who moved to Cuba to take part in the island's new revolutionary project, a compelling political model given the similar colonial relationships both Cuba and Hawaii historically had to the US. Upon successfully ousting the US-backed military dictatorship of Fulgencio Batista, Fidel Castro in the 26th of July movement almost immediately implemented widespread land reform to shift from transnational cash crop plantations to more localized food production, a call very similar to that which was being expressed in Hawaii. As che, Guevara, as che Guevara noted in a statement just as applicable to Hawaii as it was in Cuba, quote, Radical agrarian reform, the only type that could give land to the peasants, clashed directly with the interests of the imperialists, the large landholders, and the sugar and cattle magnates." End quote. More artistic efforts to document and support the budding sovereignty movement soon emerged. Comprised of American-born Joan Lander and the late Hawaiian-Palestinian Puhipau, the filmmaking duo Namaka Oka'aina, or The Eyes of the Land, formed in 1981 for one purpose, to speed up the process toward sovereignty. Speaking about the directed efforts of Namaka Oka'aina in relation to the broader sovereignty movement, Puhi Pao stated, quote, we are now discovering a lot of our, of our culture. Our language has started to emerge. Sailing, for instance, has revived itself. The hula has come back. And the only thing that really hasn't taken place yet is a grasp on the land. That's our final goal, to lock in control of our land to make sure our descendants and our children and their children will have a place in Hawaii, end quote. Namaka Oka'aina has made countless documentaries about political struggle, cultural heritage, and environmental knowledge in Hawaii. Echoing the revolutionary ideals of third cinema developed in the 1960s and 70s, 
Puhi Pao described the impetus toward filmmaking as the means of building a base of consciousness and keeping stories alive for future generations. Such is evident in documentaries like Ahupua'a, Fish Ponds, and Lo'i, which highlighted traditional forms of land management, sustainable agriculture, and food sovereignty. Puhi Pao claimed that Namaka Oka'aina's work is, quote, totally against the government and it's totally against tourism. It's totally against the whole capitalist system. It's totally against the whole being of America being in our homeland, end quote. Through such educational and agitational content, Namaka Oka'aina produced a concentrated and subversive counter archive of events, reclaiming the narrative even as land was being wrested away. Like Broderick's billboard, Grievy's photographs and Namaka Oka'aina's films engage land and landscape through a lens that is as culturally aware as it is politically developed. Utilizing visual theorist W.J.T. Mitchell's argument that landscape has shifted from a genre of painting or photography to a more discursive artistic medium of cultural expression, we can consider these and other related practices in Hawaii as representative of an expansive artistic medium of aloha aina. With its most direct translation being love of the land, aloha aina is a popular phrase often used to advocate protecting the environment, but it also retains historical undertones of national liberation. As helpfully articulated by McGregor, aloha aina has historically embodied several layers of responsibility. Quote, at one, at one level, it meant protecting the, phys the physical sustainability of Hawaiian lands and natural resources. At another level, it meant organizing and rallying for Hawaiian native rights and sovereignty to achieve the political standing necessary to protect the aina. At the deepest level, it meant a spiritual dedication to honor and worship the gods who are spiritual life in those forces of nature." End quote. If the work of Grivi and Namaka Oka Aina can be understood through the medium of Aloha Aina, I further contend their work should be considered as a form of land art, which would radically reposition the art movement toward new liberatory ends well beyond what its white Euro-American male progenitors originally imagined. To distinguish these crucial differences, allow me to differentiate the work I've already discussed with a more traditional example of land art in Hawaii. In 1977, Hawaii-based artist Thomas Woodruff completed the earthwork titled Carolina in front of Maui High School in Kahului, Maui. Measuring around 85 meters long and over 40 meters wide, and described by the artist as land waves, the work consists of three undulating dep depressions and corresponding protuberances of earth, meant to offer a contrast to the flatness of the school's location within Maui's central valley. Upon the completion of the work, and sounding very much like a typical land artist of the time, Woodruff, <clears throat> excuse me, Woodruff explained his motivations, quote, I was trying to investigate the possibility of making art out of dirt. I developed a system or an idea of a hole in the dirt that comes out of that hole." End quote. Woodruff directly referenced the influence of American land artists Michael Heiser and Robert Smithson in their most famous works, Double Negative and Spiral Jetty, differentiating his approach by arguing that in Carolina, there is nothing added to or subtracted from the earth. Heiser's and Smithson's work are arguably the two most paradigmatic examples of land art for multiple reasons including their scale, site specificity, and location in rural areas rather removed from contemporary population centers, requiring miles of travel on dirt roads to access them in Nevada and Utah, respectively. Following a Honolulu advertiser announcement of Woodruff's completed sculpture in a write-up titled Earthy Art That Some Won't Dig, it was clear that some indeed did not find the work to be of much merit. A Hawaii resident by the name of Hugh S. Jensen wrote a letter to the editor describing his past employment as a construction worker, whose main duty it was to create tourist complexes during his naive years of dawning awareness, pointing out his prior complicity and alluding to the similarities between construction workers and land artists. Jensen details his own experiences creating a landscape of rolling and gently dipping slopes out of what was once flat and rocky land, during the construction of the Kuilima Hotel and Golf Course, which is now Turtle Bay Resort on Oahu. He ends his letter suggesting that Woodruff's work is an insult to all the construction brothers on all these islands, ironically pondering all that artistic mana'o or knowledge going unnoticed. 
Despite its general anti-art sentiment, Jensen's letter is actually a piercing piece of art criticism, for it proves the need to rethink and expand what might be worth considering as land art in Hawaii. While the qualities that originally made land art noteworthy in the American art context are, are now cause for much criticism, especially from indigenous peoples, similar efforts in Hawaii, such as Woodruff's, were immediately received with disapproval precisely because their uncritical aesthetics of land transformation too closely reproduced post-statehood tourism development. Woodruff's sculpture was commissioned by the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, one of the few relatively well-funded and influential art institutions in Hawaii, along with the Honolulu Museum of Art, the Honolulu Mayor's Office for Culture and the Arts, and the University of Hawaii at Manoa Art Department. I don't know if that's well-funded, actually. Uh, scholar, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Scholars and artists such as D. Uh, Mahalani Dudois, Herman P. E. K. Clark, and Karen Kosasa have noted the long disregard and castigation of Native Hawaiian culture, concerns, and practices in such institutional settings, which has slowly improved in recent decades. Despite, or perhaps because of such biases, critical contemporary practices in Hawaii have evolved more from the counter-institutional framework offered by those such as Grivi and Namaka Oka'aina than from the institutionally supported work like that of Woodruff, despite the continued existence of Carolina as seen in this photo I took in 2019. In contrast to Woodruff's depoliticized approach that fails to engage with concerns of land and its sociocultural implications in Hawaii, others have evoked politics through place-specific sculptural, sculptural work that clearly connect processes of land desecration with cultural erasure and displacement caused by US occupation. In order to address the issue of Native Hawaiian houselessness, for example, Kanaka artist Bernice Akamine began her ongoing project Ku'u One Hanau, or Sands of My Birth, or Birthplace, in 1999. Consisting of a metal tent structure covered by a large high Hawaii or Hawaiian flag and containing a woven cardboard mat on the inside, Akamine initially installed the work Beachside at Makaha on Oahu's west side, a predominantly Native Hawaiian community overexploited, underserved, and home to a sizable houseless population. Following Akamine and others, I am purposefully using the term houseless here rather than homeless, as it is often said that Hawaii is home to Hawaiians, the ability to have an approved structural house notwithstanding. In Hawaii, Hawaiians make up a disproportionate amount of the houseless population, where the housing market primarily serves non-local buyers and foreign investors, and is also impacted by the military's housing allowance, producing artificial scarcity and driving up the average cost of living, all while hundreds of thousands of hotel rooms temporarily serve tourists. Akamine's Ku'u One Hanau has been installed throughout Hawaii since its first iteration, as well as places on the continental US. At each location, Akamine meets with and receives permission from the respective houseless communities. She often adds things to the inside of the tents to make them specific to their setting, such as photographs of community individuals taken by Ed Grevy in early iterations. This collaborative approach is further exemplified by the included cardboard versions of the traditional lahala mat, which is usually woven in a collaborative process. The finished mat inside the tents offers a communal resting area for viewers to interact with the work through conversation with others, while also retaining a direct connection to the land upon which they are sitting. Expanding on Ku'u One Hanau, Akamine's other work has addressed military testing in Hawaii at sites such as Makua Valley and Bohakuloa, which are just some of the many locations where the US military has long bombed the Hawaiian Islands. One of the more egregious instances of military exercises in the biennial is the biennial Rim of the Pacific exercise, or RIMPAC, the world's largest maritime warfare training showcase hosted by the US Indo-Pacific Command at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. During a typical RIMPAC year, up to 25,000 troops from over 20 partnering countries converge on Hawaii, showcasing their warfare abilities and newest weaponry through live fire training, beach assault drills, undersea sonar testing, and explosive ordnance disposal. 
These activities have untold ecological consequences that have long generated protests from environmental activists, de demilitarization groups, and artist collectives. The weekend before the 2020 edition of RIMPAC was scheduled to commence, Tropic Zine, who described themselves as a form for critical engagement comprising a print publication, a digital platform, and an organizing collective, projected cancel RIMPAC on the wooden barriers erected to block access to the Hawaii Capitol building during the pandemic. Tropic's inclusion of an overlapping globe implied RIMPAC's geopolitical ramifications and the indispensable role Hawaii plays in maintaining global US empire. As Trask bluntly puts it, quote, Hawaii is a militarized outpost of empire, deploying troops and nuclear ships to the south and east to prevent any nation's independence from American domination, end quote. Post-colonial literary scholar and former Rachel, Rachel Carson Center fellow, Elizabeth DeLowry has noted that events such as RIMPAC are directly tied to the increasing US militarization of the oceans, protecting the shipping lanes that fuel the outsized energy needs of 21st century US empire. Moreover, the US military and US military aid play the key role in maintaining and enforcing global capitalism, holding captive alternative ways of organizing, organizing society and possibilities of an environmentally just future. The eco-Marxist analysis advanced within monthly review has noted just as much, uh, emphasizing that US imperialism is, quote, an active force organized against ecological revolution, seeking to lock in the fossil fuel system and the current regime of maximal environmental degradation and human exploitation, end quote. In addition to their projection at the Hawaii Capitol, visual signage was produced for cancel RIMPAC protests during Tropic Zine's month-long residency at the Honolulu Arts Gallery Alpuni space. One such banner called to stop the bombing, echoing the protect Kaho Olave Ohana's demands during the 1970s and 1980s to halt the military's decades-long bombing of the island for testing purposes, including as part of RIMPAC exercises. Drawing further contemporary connections between Kaho Olave and RIMPAC, Nene Alum, a Hawaiian artist participating in Tropic's residency, crafted various targets with paint and paper pulp, which she displayed on the aina as a roving symbol of military threat. Acting independently of Tropic, Lum also hung a banner reading Protect Kanaloa on an overpass of Oahu's military highway system, referencing the Hawaiian akua or god of the ocean, who's one of many kino lao or physical manifestations is the island of Kaho'olawe. Lum's works infused the broader uh, cancel RIMPAC desires of demilitarization with Hawaiian beliefs, ethics, and ecological consciousness, insisting that bombing the ocean is still an act of cultural desecration. And for more on this, please see my uh, forthcoming essay and third text. I would like to end with a brief mention of Pacific Islander American artist and architect Sean Connolly. Connolly's practice triangulates experimental cartography, video work, and producing sculpture inspired by the land art movement, but articulated through a Hawaii-specific context, as seen here, which I've written about in Pacific Arts. For the sake of closing today's argument, however, I wish to highlight Connolly's ongoing and long-term speculative project, Hawaii Futures, and its varied offshoots. Displayed online utilizing Geographic Information System, or GIS software, <clears throat> excuse me, complex digital mapping, architectural rendering, and complemented by an essay cum manifesto, Hawaii Futures, described by Connolly as a digital land art project, imagines and advocates for the recovering of the Ahupua'a system of land management, which historically divided an island into wedges from the mountains to the ocean, as seen here, an organized society around sustainable, sustainable resource sharing. Hawaii Futures is thus more than just a call for Hawaiian sovereignty or land back. It is a holistic blueprint for an ecological society that could reinscribe communal use of shorelines, streams, and the uplands as a counter to zoning laws and real estate speculation imposed on the islands by US military occupation. Connolly's Hawaii Futures offers a framework for fully liberating the land once it has been freed from its current invaders. The overall project of Hawaii Futures also contains a dimension of social practice. Looking specifically at the Ahupua'a of Waikiki, for example, 
Connolly has developed a 3D Ahupua'a hollow deck projection for use at local spaces and in elementary schools to educate the community on future military infrastructure plans with the hope that such vis vis visualization will develop a more aware populace. Through such new media technologies utilized to speculate upon and imagine the yet to be determined future, Connolly's work exemplifies the revolutionary potentiality of a reimagined form of land art. If, as the abolitionist geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore insists, all liberation struggle is place-based liberation struggle, then any framework for thinking land, art, and liberation together must retain its place-based characteristics. Keeping prolonged struggles in focus to note how shifts in art and visual culture have responded to and in the best cases influenced struggle itself. As such, Hawaii is only one place where this kind of art historical framework can and should be applied, where artists have engaged land from the 1960s or another time period through the present in a manner vastly different than what currently constitutes the canon of land art. Not through art-centric sculptural, material, or formalist concerns, but rather aligned with movements that are advocating for land itself. This and the generative comparisons between such places is what my larger project aims to unearth. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>